Okay, uh, Team Sweepo, can you see the board? Okay, thank you, Jacob. Actually, as you know, have um, raised that last inequality. That's where we ended. Uh, last time. So, luminosity at the very end of the surface and total mass, kind of evaluated at the, at the uh, part. So, this is the uh, Eddington inequality. And if you make this equal, then it's called the Eddington limit. And so it tells you um, essentially how much of the pressure of the star can come from radiation versus matter. And this is a pretty cool equation. Uh, it was derived in 1920. And he didn't know how the luminosity was produced, so he didn't know about nuclear reactions. And he didn't know, I guess it was not only him, nobody knew. And he didn't really have a, a good model of the, uh, of the opacity. So just like we derived it without knowing any specifics about the physics, uh, he did it as well. So based on, on this uh, limit, he made some interesting predictions um, along with some other information because he was really synthesizing all the, the ideas of the time. So the main prediction that he made is that the energy or the luminosity came from the conversion of matter into energy. So uh, Einstein's um, relativity uh, was was known, um, but that was it. So he didn't have an idea of exactly how the uh, the matter was converted to energy. 
from uh, that was the eventually correct prediction. Uh, he also knew that uh, with some uh, mass spectrometry, or I guess it's with truck spectrometry, um, measurements at the time, he knew that an atom of helium, which has two protons and two neutrons, that it was slightly less massive than if you added four hydrogens together. So it was like, ah, that energy or that mass that is missing is being converted into, into energy. So he also, there was a, a discussion at the time about where was the age of the sun and where was the age of uh, the earth. And in the late 1800s, it was not super clear that uh, the earth was much older than several tens, let's say 20 uh, million years. So the calculation from the, what is the, uh, the lifetime of the sun you know, if you get an estimate from the gravitational potential energy, I don't know what the magnitude is. Three fifths of G m squared over R. If you put the numbers in there, this is 6.67. Where the units? Meter cube? Kilogram per second squared. What is the mass of the sun? Mm. And the radius of the sun is seven times ten to the eight meters. So from that you get 2.3 times 10 uh, to the 41 joules. What is the luminosity of the sun? What do you expect the units of luminosity to be? Yep, so this is the total luminosity. So you would do like the whole area. So it's just joules per second. So it's a power, right? Um, that's equal to. 2.8 times 10 to the 26 watts. So, power is going to be your total energy divided by the time. And this will be the lifetime of the sun. This is 
you know, if all the energy um, came just from, uh, from gravitation, Two to four. This is approximate. So this is zero point five and spin to the set fifteen. Seconds. How long is that? Well, if you wanna get it in years, Conversion factor or two four hours. So you want to count this on somewhere. Uh, two point fifteen times ten to the seven. So if we divide um, the point five, this is the five times ten to the fourteen seconds. Divided by three mm -hmm. ten to the seven um, yes, at this point. That is green. You get um yeah, <laughs> I'm gonna put it over here. Sixteen mega years. So, at the time, people like Lord Kelvin and we're doing, um, we're trying to estimate the age of the earth as just like a molten piece of rock and how long it will take for the surface to uh, to cool off and cool down and it was consistent so people thought that uh, well, that was kind of the age of the, the earth and the sun um i guess the first thing that didn't make too much sense came from um, biology when evolution became a popular theory. We were like, oh, you know, 60 million years is not really enough time for what we see to evolve. So they were expecting more like 200 or 100 million years. Uh, and then in 1896, radioactivity was discovered. And that had that had an effect on the calculations because then they had to consider that the uh, the core of the Earth will remain hot due to radioactivity, which it does. And they were also able to uh, to date the oldest rocks. They were like, oh yeah, they are at least two billion years. So many orders of magnitude difference between um, the these estimate and the oldest rocks. So something was wrong. So, you know, those must have been 
exciting times. There's something that you really don't know about stars, like a huge thing. So, Eddington, there is that one there, that one there. So in his paper, he assumed that at least 5%, well, that's the number that he used, 5% of the star was uh, hydrogen, and that that material could be converted to, uh, to helium. He also used the, um, the mass difference between helium and and four hydrogens, which is 0.7%. And he used um, energy constant to spark. And he said, somehow, this mass is being converted into energy at the, uh, at the core of stars. So you should do that calculation So 5% of the mass is hydrogen. The mass of the sun, well, it's M sun. And 7% of that I mean 0.7% of that is going to be converted into energy. And speed of light squared. So mass of the sun, two times 10 to the 30. Kilograms. So for these, you get Six point three times ten to the forty three joules. So it is two orders of magnitude larger than if, if you just consider the gravitational energy. We can put over here six. Times 10 to the 43. And instead of being up, ending up with uh, mega years, you end up with So that ends up being something like five giga years. So he was correct in everything um, except for the percentage of mass that is hydrogen. So it's actually going to be also 100% and about 10% of the hydrogen is going to be converted at the core and it'll be uh, transformed into helium. So the actual estimate for a star, the mass of the sun, the core being about 10% um, of the total mass is 10 giga years, which is the expected lifetime of the sun. So that was pretty impressive for 1920. So let's see. 
So what is the actual uh, process that is going on in the sun? Why does fusion occur? What is it? Why do they combine? Hmm? They do, but you know all the particles in the air, for example, right now are colliding against each other and they're not. And they're going fusion. How can they touch each other? How fast? I <laughs> think <laughs> How do you calculate it? Mm -hmm. So what happens if you overcome that repulsion? Why would they stick together? It's strongly to force, right? So the Coulomb potential, so you're going to have your two charges. So Z is the number of protons that you have in a, a nucleus. Times the charge, the uh, charge of the electron squared. So the charge of each proton is the same, although different sign as the electron divided by four pi epsilon naught um, r. Right, so this is the let's call it Coulomb energy. So as the radius becomes smaller and smaller, then the energy increases. And it's positive, so it like that. So this total energy. This is your radius, or your, your distance. So the nuclear force is pretty strong and it's also attractive for protons. So it's gonna look kind of like that. This is how your potential looks like to function of the distance. Um, what is this uh, distance over here? Minus 12? Why do you think it is 12 or 13? Mm -hmm. So what is the size of an atom? Mm -hmm. What is the distance between atoms in a crystal? And when you do your actual diffraction, what are the units? Mm -hmm. 
So something we can to the negative 10. Yep, um, I think 12 for 13 makes sense. Um, this is actually going to be close to 1 times 10 to the negative 15 meters. So that tells you that most of what we will consider the atom is actually kind of empty space to have the electrons around. And the nucleus is just pretty tiny. So this is called a femtometer, negative 15. And I don't know if it is official, but you can call it a Fermi. Um, people will understand. Actually, it's, I think it's more likely to call it for, for more, more common. And there's another cool unit. It's called the barn. Have you heard about it? So we were looking at opacity and cross sections before. So a barn will be um, 10 Fermi squared. So one times infinity 14 uh, meters um, squared. Quarterly um, squared. So it can be the minus 28. So before we're looking at, um, at the opacity, we had uh, this unit over there. So the same physics you know, of scattering applies to nuclear reactions, except that the targets are much smaller. This is a pretty small area. And it's called a barn because the people who are working at the Manhattan Project wanted to come up with something that will not raise suspicion. And so there's like some saying about a barn not being able to hit the long side and the wide side. Uh, but now it's a uh, SIE of the section. So it's kind of cool. Okay, so Let's assume so you have um, one of the protons over here, the Z is going to be one, and you have another one. Uh, you know, this one is at rest uh, relative to this one. And so you have the other one that is approaching. What is the energy required from that proton to get to this point, which it can uh, overcome the Coulomb potential? Oh, well, this one is one, this one is one. I'm going to call this one um, R N, or the distance of the nucleus. The so one, one, um, what is uh, the charge of the electron? Uh, oh, 1.6 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 uh, coulombs 
So it's going to be squared. And then 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught is um, the Coulomb constant. So the energy that is required for or the kinetic energy that is required of that uh, electron mm. 2.3 and centenary 13 joules which is equal to 1.44 times 10 to the sixth electron volts. So about 1.5 mega electron volts. Is that a uh, Big energy or a large energy? I mean, small or large? Hmm? What is the average energy of uh, particles in the sun, in the core? What will it be? How can we get it? Can we get an estimate? Yep. So it's going to be three halves of KBT. That's the energy. What is the temperature in the center of the core? I mean, it's the center of the sun. I think times 10 to the 7 Kelvin. So, like 10 million. 1.5? So moving over here. Yeah, you're right. So, I don't know why I wasn't writing. So eight point what? Then what is the average energy? Nineteen times ten to 
So we have a problem there. So the average temperature or the average energy of the particles at the center of the sun is less than uh, a kilo electron volt. But the energy that you require that you need to break to go over this potential is 1.5 mega electron volts. So it's about four orders of magnitude less energy than it's required. So what's going on? The pressure is just proportional to the energy. You do have more density with all the pressure, so it's more likely that you have the um, pollutions. Yes. That still doesn't save you, but but that is correct. <laughs> So, how does the distribution look like? A roller coaster, yeah. How is that distribution called? Maxwell Boltzmann. So that distribution, I'm going to write it over, write it down over here because one of the problems, homework problems. Uh, for next week, it's about showing that this is not enough. So, um, It looks it should look more like that. So it's almost like a Gaussian. In fact, if the range of velocities is very small, it will look a lot like a Gaussian. But it has a longer tail on one side. So this is the distribution function. So how many particles, and this will be normalized, you expect to have uh, at any given velocity range. So if they are massive, then you will expect the distribution to be um, narrower. And if the temperature is high, then you will expect the distribution to be um, broader. So this is actually um, important, the fact that, uh, that you have that distribution. So you can take, for example, the top 10% of the particles and they will have uh, an energy that might be a few times higher than the mean or the um, mm, 
Dungeons where we lost any. It's where Artemis. Yes. So yes, you do have a distribution of velocities. Um, it is still not going to be enough. So the, the answer is uh, quantum mechanics. So there's a probability that uh, there's going to be tunneling. So even though the particle doesn't have enough energy to overcome classically this barrier, uh, there's going to be a probability that it tunnels through the potential. We're going to look a little bit at that. So if you wanted to overcome this classically, you will need a temperature of um, 1.7 times 10 to the 10 Kelvin, which you know can be achieved by some processes, uh, supernova explosion or things like that, but not in, uh, in the core of normal stars. Okay. So, we can take the average height, this is Rn, of this potential. So, it's going to be Integral from zero to and I'm going to define another distance. I'm gonna put it over here. I'm gonna call it RC. So this is essentially the distance at which your Kinetic energy becomes zero and it's equal to the Coulomb potential. So classically, over here will be the turning point. We'll just go back. So the obstacle um, is going to be this area. So this will be from zero to RC. And then you have, this is the average. It's going to be just your, your weighted average. So we're going to replace that barrier by something that might look kind of like that. So it's going to be a square. And this is the average. And maybe
he starts to look like a problem that you have seen before. Have you? No? Investigating quantum mechanics. You took it? Did you see the um, tunneling problems? Okay. What about in uh, modern physics? Mm -hmm. Okay, but, but you're then familiar with the concepts. So this is a square well, essentially. This is your, your potential over here. So this is actually a spherically symmetric uh, potential. So it doesn't really exist in, in space, right? Or it doesn't look like this. Uh, it's more like your atom is going to have a hard time getting close to the other one. But at some point, they just, you know, they, they clamp together and they get over here. So then you're going to have your Schrodinger equation So just qualitatively, um, what is this telling you? And what is the what is psi the wave function? Well, the wave function. And the solution to this differential equation, I guess to most, is going to be, you can think about it as uh, sine waves. So in this, in this space, we don't have anything, there's no potential. Um, your wave function might look just like that. Over here, you're going to have a boundary, so you apply your boundary conditions. Uh, what happens is that your the wave function is going to decrease exponentially. You have your negative exponential. And if this barrier is wide enough or high enough, then it will just go to zero and that's it. Uh, over here you have uh, your potential over here, which is attractive. It's gonna come out and it's gonna look like that. So this is the solution to your differential equation. So there is um, there is a chance that you can actually bypass the barrier. So what is the, the probability in terms of the wave function? The square of the wave function is your probability. So yeah, everything around you is really a wave. And uh, the waves are infinite. 
And so in principle, the atoms that make you up go from minus infinity at one edge of the universe to plus infinity at the other edge. But they are, you know, bunched at your body. So maybe you look like that. Uh, so here, you know, they go from amplitude to negative amplitude. If you take the square, then you will only have positive values. And maybe this will look kind of like that. Um, they're actually, you know, much closely packed. But if you take the square of the wave function, you get the probability of finding the particle uh, in that position. So, Uh, so the solution is that or beta. Mu is the uh, with the reduced mass. So the product divided by the sum. And we need the reduced mass because uh, we took a system with two masses that were approaching each other. And we convert into a problem with only uh, one mass. So you have to put the, um, the reduced mass in there. What is it going to be you know, if both are the same? Let's say that both are protons. And it's just one half, right? Which makes sense, each part of the problem. Okay. So the wave function squared multiplied by uh, the cross section, not the cross section, the the surface of the sphere of this radius dr. So it's um, um, infinitesimally small thickness. This gives you the probability that it is at certain r. So we can take r n, no, r, r, n or n. And what is this telling you? So your wave function is going to look Thank you. 
It looks like that. And where was our end located? The nucleus, right? So over here. So this is the probability of finding, you know, out of the whole space, finding it at this radius. This is kind of similar to uh, density of states that we saw in, in thermal before. So we have a probability distribution, and um, if you want to know the probability at a particular value, then you take uh, that volume. So If we divide by the probability of finding that um, particle at C, so just where the kinetic energy becomes zero and it's equal to the Coulomb potential, then this gives you the ratio the probability that, that it's going to uh, tunnel through the barrier. So the four pi's are the same, we can get rid of them. The BRs are the same, you can get rid of them. But this is the uh, probability of time. So we know what the void function is. is just an organization constant. E uh, to the beta Rn. And there's a square, so it's twice that. And E divided by R, or well, Rn, squared. And then we have um, and over here we have the other one from what is that point C. So you can get rid of all the R squares, also the A's. And so that probability, timing probability, uh, is E to the two beta Rn. Divided by E to the two beta Rc. And Rn is much smaller than Rc. So we know that this is about 1 times 15 meters. Rc, how close they can get to each other. We were uh, saying something like negative 12 or 13. Right? That's the size of the atom. So then it's several orders of magnitude uh, smaller. 
So if Rn is very small, it goes to zero, then this is close to one. And so the tunneling probability So now, we look at that data. Will be exponent minus two square root of mu um, e. So e is the kinetic energy. So we can get rid of this E over here and then we just put it over here for root of E. Um, and This is equal to alpha h bar c. Alpha is the fine structure constant. You heard about it? Yeah, it's one of the fundamental uh, parameters and numbers of the universe. So if you look at it, it's, it just describes the strength of the um, electro uh, electrostatic, well, I guess the Coulomb potential. So its value is one over 137. And you have probably heard about it because people talk about fine tuning. And so if you change this parameter alpha, so you can do it. So all of these are fundamental constants. So if you vary this value, then you change the strength of the Coulomb interaction. So you can make it so strong that even with tunneling, you will not have, uh, you will not be able to fuse elements, so then the universe would be very different. Um, you can go in the other direction, I guess, in that case, um, everything will just fall, everything will fuse, like you will not have chemistry, for example. So, I don't know if it's finely tuned, but um, it's important because of that. Fine structure parameter. So I'm not see it in like quantum two. But anyways, I just have it here so that 
I can replace this four pi um, e squared with an alpha h bar c. And I can get rid of the h bars and it's starting to look prettier. So we took um, an average of the potential. Uh, if you don't take that average, then you end up with another factor. So every, the, the functional form is the same, but you get an, an extra pi over square root of two. Hmm? Oh yes, should get rid of it. Okay, so let's rewrite it. Um, two over square root of two. Square root of two. So let E, let's call it EG. Are we missing the pi? Yes. So let EG be pi alpha. So then we can take you know square root of g, uh, sorry e g, and it's going to give us this stuff over here. So then we can rewrite the the probability of tunneling. e to the minus eg over e to the root of these. So eg is called the Gamma energy. And this G, I'm using, it's suggestive of the density of states. It's called the gamma factor. So then the gamma energy is going to be the same for any pair of uh, particles because it depends on the nuclear charge and the 
uh, the reduced mass. So if we want to find that value, for two protons. It's gonna be pi, and then alpha is one over 137. These ones are just one and one. So we can move them out, this one is squared. Then the reduced mass, we saw that it was gonna be one half. And we have these two over here. We can get rid of that too. Well, it's just equal to one. It's gonna be bad. So why did I leave the C squared outside? Because usually the mass is given in terms of um, an energy. So for example, in the mass of the uh, proton is 0.94. Gigalactin volts divided by C squared. So then we can compare the mass of the proton. Um, we can easily compare the energy that you need with the ground state, um, sorry, rest mass of the particle. So, if you get the probability, you will see that it's approximately 10 to the negative 10, which is pretty tiny, but it's not zero. And how many particles do you have in the sun? You calculated, right? Something to the 57? Yeah. <laughs> so even though the probability of tunneling is very small, you have uh, a lot of particles. So you constantly have uh, fusion at that energy. So yeah, it's pretty, I think it's pretty remarkable, but from classical physics, this will not happen at all. And next time we're going to see you know, what's actually going on with that mass that is being lost. Um, let's see. Yeah, that's all I wanted to say. So, any questions about the forum, the homework, or anything else? No? Okay. Sounds good. Teams people? Any questions, comments? No? Uh, no. All right, I'm going to stop recording.